What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Thanks for joining us today on Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. So today we're going to be talking with Susan McKeown. Susan is a Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter. Her family has been affected by extreme states intergenerational trauma. She's of Irish ancestry, and her recent album is Singing in the Dark, which focuses on the poetry of madness. It's musical renditions of poets who've written poems about their own struggles with madness. So thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio, Susan McKeown. Thanks for having me, Will. Lovely to talk with you again. Yeah, and I've been wanting to have you on the show for quite a while. You and I actually did a little bit of touring in uh, Ireland with your album Singing in the Dark. That was fun. Yeah, it was great to meet people and to be there. And and you're not only a uh, very moving singer and, and songwriter, but you're also someone who knows a great deal about Irish lore and history. You're somewhat of a cultural historian. So your performances you know, bring together the music and also the stories behind the songs. And we're going to be hearing some of the songs and some of your work today. Tell us a little bit about this, this album that you have, Singing in the Dark, which is really a, amazing. It, it's based on musical renditions of poems about madness and your interest in it came from your own family experience of extreme states yeah it did actually that's probably a good place to start i was in in a relationship with someone who started to go into a very deep depression and go through behavioral changes that really were shocking to me so a lot of different things changed within me i started with them trying to look for help And that's what led to my wanting to educate myself about mental health. And that took a while because the search for help went down the traditional routes and we didn't really find help for quite some time. But on another level, it led me to question within my own family uh, certain events or messages that had come through the family and I guess when I was growing up, uh, the group of teenagers, I'd been with a very close-knit group of teenagers. I was angry at, you know, the mainstream discourse about mental health and the amount of glossy ads I could see for from the pharmacological industry. Uh, you know, it was irritating to me that there wasn't um, any other kind of discourse on a, on what I felt was a deeper level to do with us as human beings. That was kind of harder to access. So that's what led me to make the record and to want to learn more about it, educate myself more about contemporary approaches. But the teen group, the group as teenagers that I had grown up with, there was a a brother and sister whose father died by suicide then when we were in our 20s. And another two from the group, uh, one uh, murdered the other when we were in our 30s. And these events were so shocking to us all. And I felt, what if... There had been open conversation when we were teenagers. What if we had discussed the possibilities of the thoughts that were in our heads and and felt safe doing that? What if we'd had discussions about the secrets that came back in that way in our 20s and 30s? So I've really developed a great interest in education and talking about things that weren't talked about in my own family when I was growing up and also in the connection between uh, cultural identity and mental health. So when these tragedies happened, you didn't really talk about I mean, you're like most communities, they just become overwhelming tragedies that, that everyone is kind of in shock about and then sort of buries under kind of the more formalities of, of grieving and response and, and but really getting into what happened and talking about people's feelings and thoughts and all the different considerations about it, that didn't happen. Exactly. And what's interesting about that is that in some of the work I do, because I also have been recording albums of traditional Irish music for, for years, um, there's a particular ritual that occurred in Ireland, which was wiped out by edicts from the Catholic Church sent down to parish priests from the 14th and 15th centuries to wipe out the process called keening. And I know your listeners will know the word keening, but a lot of people might not know that it comes from a Gaelic word, keena, to cry, to grieve. 
and it was a very funny enough formalized ritual where people could let down for three days. You might have heard of the Irish wake and there's various stereotypical associations with it in recent centuries but for centuries before that it was a time when people conducted particular games there was uh, opportunities to celebrate the person's life as well as to grieve and you could cry and mourn and it was also an opportunity for people to express other things that might have been coming up in a social context um, in recent history so there's various examples of these keens which was an oral composition. It was orally done by women, but examples were written down from the late 1700s and throughout the 1800s where women spoke out about other injustices like domestic violence that they had witnessed within the community. And at this time when somebody had died, it was felt to be a safe place where they could express this and nothing could be said against them. And also going on were people grieving the dead person, banging on the boards of the coffin, tearing their hair, gathering together. There's various examples of people trying to describe the lament of the keen as kind of an otherworldly sound coming from these women who, as young girls, had watched the older women keening and learnt the art from them. So it's very interesting. I've been having discussions recently with other singers because these were things we weren't taught at school either, but there's a greater knowledge coming now. People are doing a lot more research into these things that we didn't have access to, but we want to claim because they are our own. So a tragedy happens and the community comes together to create a ritual to express the emotions, but also to create a space for certain kinds of truths to come out and people to have permission to say things about injustices or things that maybe haven't been said before. And I imagine, is that really why the Catholic Church suppressed these rituals? It seems to be that in all of the synod gatherings, the text that they use is to stop the women at the entrances to the graveyards. And if any of your listeners, is, listeners are particularly interested in this topic, the woman who I know has written most about this is a woman called Angela Burke, B-O-U-R-K-E, who has also written about the Irish writer Maeve Brennan, who wrote for The New Yorker, by the way, and a book about fairy belief in Ireland called The Burning of Bridget Cleary. But Angela Burke has written numerous papers on keening. As far as I'm concerned, she's the world authority on keening. Um, so it was, yes, that um, opportunity to speak about those things, and it was led by women. And it was clear in the text that the instruction to the priests from the bishops was to stop the women and to take control of the funeral practice and bring it into the, uh, the directives from Rome. And this is, Susan, why I'm, I'm so supportive of your work and have, I'm really happy to have you on Madness of Radio because you're basically addressing mental health issues, extreme states, madness, suicide, from a completely non-medical perspective. You are responding in a way which is about the community and about arts and around culture that I think is actually the direction that we need to go. So when your partner had this very, very deep depression, it started a whole journey for you for discovering secrets and things that weren't talked about in your own family. Is that right? In my own family, yeah, there's been trauma going back some generations. I suppose I have to connect it to my journey to educate myself because in my looking for help, I found a local group here in Manhattan. And I have to say, I, I loved the people there and they were really helpful to me. And their information was coming from what I now see as the medical model. It really helped me uh, get through a difficult time in my own life when some, you know, life-changing events then happened to me all at the same time. I think what you're saying is really important, Susan, because a lot of the family groups that are out there do have connections with pharmaceutical funding or who do come from a biological perspective in their information. But at the same time, there are very real connections, personal connections that happen, and people do get really, really good help from those connections. And I think we really need to recognize that when we're trying to understand about the family groups because often they're the only thing that, that's out there available for people and it's good that people are able to find connection and, and you were able to find connection through going to the group in, in your community, it sounds like. 
Well, I actually went to a, a small independent group called MDSG. The title is Mood Disorder Support Group. And they're a few blocks from where I live. And there's some fantastic people there. They talked about NAMI somewhat. And when I started to develop the album idea, I learned about NAMI. And I went to a NAMI conference in San Francisco one year. And I remember running into somebody there who very early in the conversation identified themselves as a family member and I found that jumped out as me as it just seemed like code for I'm not somebody struggling I'm not somebody with these struggles uh, I felt uncomfortable identifying myself as as on one side or the other of this because it's my family's struggle and at the same time I went to an incredible session at that conference on Native American and Alaskan and Pacific Islanders and their approaches to trauma within their communities, which was really enlightening. And also, at the time, I was up visiting my friend Natalie Merchant. I told her I really had this drive to make this album next, and I wanted it to be poems and language from poets talking about their struggles. I had already started reading poems and found poems where on the one hand the poet was talking about their struggle but on the other there was this rising beyond it into something that I just thought was this sacred connection with something very deep about themselves and Natalie said have you read Kay Jameson's book Touched with Fire and I said no I'd never heard of her so I went and read that book and was I found it very compelling about the connection between creativity and mental health and moods. And I wrote to Kay and she wrote back to me straight away and I told her what I wanted to do and I was still very much in the early stages of learning um, and she wrote back enthusiastically saying I love what you're doing, what your goal is and um, I love Celtic music and whenever you're ready I'd be delighted because I'd asked her to write an introductory essay for the album which she did and and she was wonderful, you know. I think a lot of people come to these questions through Kay Jamison's books, and, and she's raising a lot of really provocative, very, very interesting points. Unfortunately, it all gets kind of channeled into this question of biology explaining everything, and that's often where the family groups are coming from. But you, one of the things that I, I really like about working with you and, and our, our friendship is that you have been on really on a journey of learning and discovering and going deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think it's really your sensibilities as an artist and also a cultural historian that have guided you to ask deeper questions and really start to make the connections that I think a lot of people don't, don't end up making. Yeah, you know, I see that now and I see what I found in inspiring, you know, I found that uh, Touched with Fire inspiring and Kay's book about her own experiences. I admired how open she was about her own struggles. And then I came to see that Med's work for Kay, that she has found her way to deal with it. We've had some great discussions about it. However, I was working with a lot of people at the time that they weren't finding the answers in the traditional channels of help. And I knew that I wanted to help them find the other answers that they needed and that they were out there. It just was going to take a deeper search. And as I mentioned earlier, I was getting more frustrated with what's in your face when you walk into the doctor's office or open a glossy magazine that the answer was meds and, and these ads were people with smiley faces like you know pop a pill and you're going to find happiness well that's obviously not true and it's just it seemed like a cover-up and there was a deeper human answer um, and answers and deeper human questions and I wanted to dig deeper and find out what they were because there's a meaning to suffering and I wanted to go deeper into that. And I think there's a continuity between the way in which society says, okay, this is biological, this is about medications, it's about getting treated by a doctor. There's a continuity between that and the way in which historically certain kinds of truths, certain kinds of voices, certain kinds of practices, certain kinds of community expressions have been suppressed. It's just too dangerous to let women be leading these rituals. It's too dangerous for people to speak up about domestic violence or to say the truth of what might have been involved with this um, suicide because it may have been related to incest or sexual abuse. That is politically very 
dangerous and something we talked about quite a bit on Madness Radio is that the way in which medicalizing problems takes the attention away from very real social, political, historical, cultural questions, including oppression. And I know that's been really huge in the Irish and both in Irish immigrants in the United States and Irish in Ireland, that the connections between that oppression and the way in which mental health issues have been expressed or been responded to. One day I, I just started to think about, well, why are the Irish so famous? Why is probably each one of your listeners able to name an Irish musician and able to name an Irish writer and perhaps one who has won the Nobel Prize for Literature? Why are we outstanding in levels of creativity? And we're known to be storytellers and jokers and singers. And we have this history of trauma that goes back hundreds of years. And we're known for that too. The work that was done to wipe out Keening uh, by the church, I now I feel I can see the effects of that today within families, within relationships between men and women. Within my own family, I suppose what happened, um, my mother died when we were all aged between 15 and 23. And within six months, most of my siblings had moved out and I lived with my dad effectively for the next six years. And what struck me was we didn't have any tools to deal with that. And uh, so just on my own personal level, um, that event was shocking because there was no family sit down to talk about it, you know. And so because I'm a singer, an artist, and I always want to talk about these things, there wasn't really a space where everybody was comfortable doing that and um, of course everybody was in pain and so a lot of my drive today might be connected to that you know well you've done an incredible thing with um creating this uh, the cd singing in the dark which i really encourage people to check out why don't we listen to just a clip an excerpt from one of the songs do you want to set it up for us sure and um, one of my favorite poems um is from theodore ruska who was from Michigan, and he was the son of German immigrants. And it's an incredible poem. He was 15 when his father died, and his uncle died by suicide. And his father and uncle had been market gardeners and done quite well in their town in Saginaw. And so Theodore had grown up in these giant greenhouses and the influence of nature in his poetry is is right there. It's such a beautiful poem connecting his suffering with nature in an incredibly hopeful way. And what is the title of the poem? In a Dark Time. In a dark time the eye begins to see I meet my shadow in the deepening shade I hear my echo in the echoing wood A lord of nature weeping to a tree A lord of nature weeping to a tree I live between the heron and the wren Beasts of the hill and serpents of the den Nobility of soul at odds with circumstance The day is on fire I know the purity of pure despair My shadow pinned against a sweating wall That place among the rocks Is it a cave or winding path? The edge is what I have I live between the heron and the red Beasts of the hill And serpents of the den A steady storm of correspondence A night flowing with birds A ragged moon and in 
broad day, the midnight come again A man goes far to find out what he is Death of the self in a long tearless All night All natural shapes blazing a natural light Dark, dark my light And darker my desire My soul like some heat maddened summer fly Keeps buzzing at the sill which I is I A fallen man I climb out of my fear The mind enters itself And God the mind And one is one Free in the tearing wind Such powerful words, imagery, and your voice is, is so beautiful. Thank you for that, Susan, from your new album, Singing in the Dark. And can you, could you just recite the poem? Because I think it, it captures so much of the mystery and power of these terrifying and also transcendent states that we call madness. In a Dark Time by Theodore Ruska. In a dark time, the eye begins to see. I meet my shadow in the deepening shade. I hear my echo in the echoing wood, a lord of nature weeping to a tree. I live between the heron and the wren, beasts of the hill and serpents of the den. What's madness? But nobility of soul at odds with circumstance. The day's on fire. I know the purity of pure despair. My shadow pinned against a sweating wall. That place among the rocks, is it a cave or winding path? The edge is what I have. A steady storm of correspondences, a night flowing with birds, a ragged moon, and in broad day, the midnight come again. A man goes far to find out what he is, death of the self in a long, tearless night. All natural shapes blazing, unnatural light. Dark, dark my light, and darker my desire. My soul, like some heat-maddened summer fly, keeps buzzing at the sill. Which I is I? A fallen man, I climb out of my fear. The mind enters itself, and God the mind, and one is one, free in the tearing wind. One of my favorite lines from that poem it just is, 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 is devastating. And it goes, what's madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? <laughs> That's like a, it's like a koan for discovering who you are and what, what those states meant. So, so um, to the universe, I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing, amazing poem. And let's go to another clip from your album. Another one I love, um, I love them all, but uh, this one is A Woman Like That. It's the poem Her Kind by Anne Sexton. And I found it interesting that it was when Anne Sexton started going to therapy. I think she'd had a second breakdown when she was about 27. And her therapist recommended she start writing poetry. And that was why she started writing poetry. And she's one of the greatest poets the United States has produced and won numerous awards, including the Pulitzer Prize. And it was the opposite advice, which was given to an Irish poet, Maeve McGuckian. And she had a breakdown and went to her therapist and her therapist recommended she stop writing poetry. And I read about this um, in writings by one of our great Irish poets, Nuala Egonal who said, but sure, how could we do that? It's the poetry that keeps us alive. So this poem is just a phenomenal poem about Anne's struggle. And I can, we can all see in it her struggle with society, uh, trying to be the perfect wife in the 50s and also be a mother and give care when she was trying to give care to herself. Every woman's struggle and every mother's struggle. And then Anne had these other levels of a struggle that she was going through as well, but there's messages in it um, that speak to us all. I have gone out a possessed witch Haunting the black air Braver at night Dreaming evil I have 
very powerful, a different kind of quality to that poem, or at least your rendition of it is a defiance in there as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's beautiful um, footage on YouTube of Anne reciting that poem right into the camera in a very seductive, a very provocative way. And there's something in it that we all long for, to be able to be so bold as to really express ourselves. You've been listening to an interview with Susan McKeown. Susan is a Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter whose family has been affected by extreme states and intergenerational trauma. Her recent album, Singing in the Dark, is musical renditions of poems written by poets struggling with madness. And we should thank Anne and apparently also thank her therapist, at least a little bit, <laughs> for having encouraged her client to, to do that as a therapeutic practice. I think that it's really true that art and creativity are absolutely therapeutic, but do you think that it's also true that sometimes it might be smart to not be artistic or not write poems or not be creative? Do you ever feel like there are times when you need to stay away from your creativity to kind of help your own mental wellness? I haven't experienced that myself. I've always felt sometimes there's a time to put it out in the world and there's a time to just express it yourself and, and be writing. I always feel when something's coming and it feels like it's coming from outside myself, but it's my call to pick up on it and put it down on paper or pick up the guitar and start finding out what it is and discovering it uh, because it's going to be something key to my own journey of self-discovery um, that's always been fruitful for me, I'm so happy to say. <laughs> I know for me, sometimes the creative process is very, very connected to the inner critic process that I can become blocked or shame myself or judge myself for not doing it right or not doing it well enough or, or not being able to do it at all. And sometimes I do want to just step back from all of it, but it's really not the creativity. It's more the, the process of judgment and self-sabotage that comes along with it. That's really interesting. You know, um, I don't know if you saw that uh, documentary about the um, architect Frank Gehry. And in the first moment or two, um, it opens in darkness. And then I think it cuts to him sketching on a pad. But he's talking about the moment when you have to begin a work. You have to begin letting the creativity flow. And how difficult it is to just let that flow because you get in the way. All these voices come to tell you you're not good enough and you've got to tidy up your office. And he says he always starts tidying up his office and seeing all these other things he has to do rather than actually be about the work and just sitting with it and let it in. 
So it's about trying to find the voice that's, <laughs> as Theodore Rothko would say, which I is I, that just lets you get out of your way. You said something, Susan, that, that many creative people say, that the creative act, the voice or the image or the song or whatever it is is coming through you from somewhere else and you need to let it come through you. What what do you make of that? Because so many people do experience that in, inspiration. I know I experience it in, in my work, not just creative work, but also just writing and doing work, community work. The idea that something is coming through you, how do you explain that? It's not something I can explain. <laughs> But it connects to, you know, some of the, the most profound experiences I've ever had in my life, uh, like the moment of being present when my father departed this earth and the moment when I gave birth to my daughter and the energy that was present was something I could not explain. And I feel that way when I feel so privileged to have had this experience of something flow through my hands or through my voice and uh, just feel privileged and gifted. And it makes me think of Theodore Rothke again. In one of the biographies I read of him, it talks about how when he wrote one of his famous poems called The Dance, I think it's called The Dance or um, Dances in the title, and he talks about having been teaching in the, the meter in which that poem is written, he had been teaching that meter to his students for weeks at the university where he was teaching up in Washington State. And then one evening, he wrote that poem in a half hour. And it's one of the greatest poems he had ever written. And he knew it. And as soon as he had finished it, he got down on his knees because that was what he always did when he knew that something mm. great had, had come, you know, that he had completed a great piece of work. And that's kind of like the flow you feel. And it's probably a good segue into the next song, maybe, if you'd like to do another piece of music. And it's from an Irish poet, James Clarence Mangan. And it's a pretty dark poem that he wrote in 1849, the year before his death. He was born in Dublin in 1803, and he may never have left Dublin. And it's interesting to note that he died during one of the worst years of the Irish famine. And when he died, his causes of death were related to alcoholism and malnutrition. And yet he was one of our greatest poets. And about him, Yeats said, to the soul of Clarence Mangan was tied the burning ribbon of genius. So in this really dark poem, which is very autobiographical about his struggle, he has this first verse, which I turned into the chorus, which connects with what we've just been talking about. And the chorus is... Roll forth my song like the rushing river that sweeps along to the mighty sea. God will inspire me while I deliver my soul of thee. Tell thou the world when my bones lie white and amid the last homes of youth and death. There was one whose veins ran lightning No eye beheld Tell how his boyhood was one drear night hour How shone for him through his griefs and bloom No star of all heaven sends To light our path to the tomb Roll forth my song like the rushing river that sweeps along to the mighty sea. God will inspire me while I deliver my soul of thee. Deep but intense and rapid 
inspire me while I deliver my soul of Thee. Very powerful and very dark and intense poem. And also what you were saying before, Susan, about him writing during the era of the Irish famine also reminds me a little bit about the connection between us because you and I were sort of brought together by the hand of fate synchronistically in some ways. We sort of found each other and then I ended up doing a few um, speaking engagements at your concerts in Ireland, which is a great opportunity. And one of the things that I talk about is that it's an opportunity for me to connect with some of my ancestry too because my mom is mixed race Choctaw Indian and the Choctaw tribe played an important role in famine relief, in supporting the Irish during the famine. And so there's that historical legacy of a connection that we have in in our ancestry that I really like. It's so interesting, the story of how the Choctaw collected monies to send to the Irish who were suffering because of the famine. And they recognized what was happening immediately because of their own experience. And in many ways today, I think we still in Ireland haven't completely dealt with all of the traumatic events of the famine even today, but we're we're continually telling and learning more stories about what happened at that time. Because I think that is a way of understanding the experience of the Irish is of an indigenous people that was displaced by colonialism. Yes. So let's listen to one more song from your album, Singing in the Dark. Thanks. This is um, a poem I came across because the documentary filmmaker Anne Makepeace, who has made a number of films about Native Americans. In fact, her latest one has to do with language. She told me about a Welsh poet who's named Gwyneth Lewis, who's a contemporary poet who was a fellow at Stanford in 2010 when I discovered her. And she has written numerous books and plays. And one of her first books of poetry uh, was subtitled A Cheerful Book on Depression and won numerous awards in the United Kingdom. And the poem that I chose to set to music of hers is called Angel of Depression. If it's okay with you, Will, I'll read you the poem before you hear the song. Absolutely. Why would an angel choose to come here if it weren't important? Into stuffy rooms smelling of cabbage. Into the tedium of time which weighs like gravity on any messenger used to more freedom and who has to wear a dingy costume so as not to scare the humans. Wouldn't even an angel despair? Oh yes, I'm broken, but my limp is the best part of me and the way I hurt. Don't say it's an honor to have fought with depression's angel. It always wears the face of my loved ones as it tears the breath from my solar plexus, grinds my face in the ever resilient dirt. Oh yes, I'm broken. But my limp is the best part of me and the way I hurt. I just want to add that she doesn't actually repeat that last line in the poem, but I did for the song. Why would an angel choose to come here if it weren't important? Into stuffy rooms smelling of cabbage Into the tedium of time which weighs like gravity On any messenger used to more freedom And who has to wear a dingy costume So as not to scare the humans Wouldn't even an angel despair Oh yes, I'm It's an honor to have fought with depression's angel. It always wears the face of my loved ones as it tears the breath from my solar plexus. My limp is the best part of me And the way I hurt Oh yes, I'm broken 
beautiful. It's such a beautiful image that, yes, I, I have been injured. I have been wounded. I don't quite have all of me here in the same way. And yet, at the same time, that's something that I celebrate because it's actually given me very, very positive things. Yes. And also to add for your listeners that there is YouTube footage of Gwyneth available where she talks about about her work and the sense of permissiveness in moving to the United States uh, that came to her about her work. And she started out writing in Welsh. We have a little bit of time. Should we listen to one more poem? There's a poem called Crazy Woman by Gwendolyn Brooks. Do you want to introduce that one? I'd love to. You know, I don't know a lot about Gwendolyn Brooks' personal life, but when I came across this poem, I just thought it was so beautiful and so simple about having a different wish and going against what the norm is, that it, it, it appealed to me greatly. And she has such a beautiful way with language. Uh, she was a poet from Chicago, and she was encouraged by her parents. They must have spotted her talent early because as a teenager, one of her parents brought her to meet the poet Langston Hughes, who encouraged her to start trying to get published. I think she was about 17. And she was born in 1917, and she ended up becoming the first African-American to win the Pulitzer Prize. So this is her poem, The Crazy Woman, and I set this one to music. I should add that I set most of the poems on the album to music, and I did invite two friends to set to music um, two of the poems that um, we heard the renditions of earlier. In a Dark Time, the music was written by Frank London, and um, Her Kind or A Woman Like That, the music was written by Lisa Gutkin, and they're both friends of mine who are members of the Klasmatics and wonderful composers, so I invited them to contribute to the album in that way. Something you said about Gwendolyn Brooks brings me back to the Rothka line where he says, what's madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? And that I think is a very interesting way of understanding extreme states and madness and, and suicide and depression as, as a kind of resistance, as a kind of rebellion. And I know that that gets into tricky territory because we don't want to romanticize these experiences that are so so much suffering is associated with them, but there's a way in which conflict and often conflict with the situation that you're in, conflict with an oppressive society or an oppressive relationship or an oppressive family drives us crazy. And do you think that that's, that's a thread that you've seen in the poetry you've been exploring around madness? I mean, that is something you see in poetry. You know, it makes me think of my own songwriting and my own resistance to change. And that's what I address a lot in my own songwriting. I think it often comes down to my own struggles with the way things are around me. Does that make sense? <laughs> I just remember at some point when I was going through my... Um, I remember at some stage thinking about us in terms of our reactions to trauma being perfectly normal considering the environment that we're in or the circumstances that have occurred and the way they're perceived by other people um, might be their difficulty because they're not aware of of the traumas that we might have experienced and how things have impacted us as human beings I'm quite sure I'm not articulating that as well as I'd like to, but that's something I find very inspiring about the introductions of your show each time, the thing that you say. What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Exactly, because exactly. when you're living under a set of circumstances and, and things that have occurred and the intricacies of the connections between us and other human beings, something not just being self-contained in one human being, but occurring in your relationships with others, and then circumstances, then it, it's often obvious that it's no wonder people react in particular ways. It's perfectly normal considering what happened to them. I do. I think that they explore deeply and see things from many different perspectives. So let's listen to your rendition of Crazy Woman by Gwendolyn Brooks. I shall not sing a May song a May song should be gay I'll wait until November And 
sing a song of grey I'll wait until November That is the time for me I'll go out in the frosty dark And sing most terribly And all the little people will stare at me and say That is the crazy woman who would not sing in May I shall not sing a May song A May song should be gay Until November And sing a song of grace Susan, I have to say, having you on Skype here, could you just sing for our audiences just on Skype right now some, <laughs> uh, one of the passages from that poem? That would be great. I shall not sing a May song. A May song should be gay. I'll wait until November and sing a song of gray. Amazing. Susan, we don't have a lot of time. Remind people about the album that we've been um, hearing excerpts of songs from and how they can get a copy of it and get in touch with you. Thanks, Will. We've been listening to songs from my album Singing in the Dark, which is available widely online and at my website, which is my favorite place for people to purchase it. My website location is susanmckeown.com, which is spelled S-U-S-A-N-M-C. K-E-O-W-N. You can order physical copies of the CD there. And if you should find it online as an MP3 download, you're welcome to write to me and we could figure out how you could uh, send me a stamped address envelope if you wanted to receive the physical liner notes booklet, which has all of the poems in it and my notes and all the credits for the, all the people involved in making the album. And Susan, what's next for you? You have a new album that's out, and what's your plans for the future? Well, this it's a brand new album. It's called Belong, and these are all my own songs. It's my third album of completely original words and music, and they're all songs I've written in the last 10 years, and that's widely available and on my website. And I have two other records in the works, so right now I'm going to be promoting Belong for the next while, six months to 12 months. Um, one of the albums is an album of Shan Nose, which is the Gaelic for old way, uh, of very old Gaelic songs from the Gaelic tradition, which I'm singing in Irish and in English, with an Irish guitarist and a fado guitarist from the Portuguese tradition, because to me these are very passionate songs from a very high art form, this style of Gaelic singing. And then the other project is an album of fairy songs, from the Irish tradition, many of them again are in Gaelic and hundreds of years old, from people who lived with a belief that the fairy world, the realm was ever present, very close at hand. And some of us still do live with that belief. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what I find so interesting about these old songs that are expressing things that are very resonant and real to me today in a contemporary way. So I love researching these lyrics of songs that are only now available in books and may never have been recorded 
and bringing them to today's audience because I believe they can relate in a very contemporary way. Susan McCown, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thanks for having me. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. For seven years and more than 125 shows, Madness Radio has been bringing unique voices and visions to community radio. Now Madness Radio needs your help. Go to madnessradio.net and join our Kickstarter fundraising campaign. You've been listening to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Listen on the internet at madnessradio.net and on iTunes. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.